live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. I want to give you a hypothetical scenario. Suppose this is high school, and it's the senior class, and it's time to determine who gets to be valedictorian of the class for having the best grades. And at the end of the year, you've got two kids who sit atop everyone else with 3.9 grade point averages. Let's call them Jimmy and Tommy. Per school policy, there can only be one valedictorian in a class, so you can't have co-valedictorians. This means that you need to determine some method of breaking this tie. As a first tiebreaker, you look to see if they had any common classes together, and see if any of the students did better than the other one. However, that tiebreaker doesn't work, because they had an English class together, and they both got an A there. So you go to another tiebreaker, and decide to determine it by who ended the year with the most A's, and who got the most 4.0 averages amongst classes. And when you break it down, Jimmy finished with 5 4.0 averages, while Tommy finished with 4. So the tie should go to Jimmy, and it does. However, Jimmy took an insanely easy schedule. Knowing that none of his credits would be accepted by the college that he wanted to go to, he decided to take a complete joke of his schedule, taking all regular level classes, taking multiple gym classes, and taking electives where he knew that all you had to do was show up to get an A. Meanwhile, Tommy took all AP level classes, including the highest level of calculus offered by the high school, took an extensive research-based class as one of his electives, and took multiple AP classes in science that required lab work. In other words, it seems unfair that we're punishing Tommy in this case for having a significantly tougher schedule by his own choosing. That seems counterintuitive and seems like an absolutely horrible way to break a tie. So why do I bring this hypothetical up? Because this team right here that you've been watching this whole time is the 2000 Oregon Ducks. And thanks to the absolutely backwards tiebreaker scenarios that the Pac-10 had in place, they got completely screwed over because of something that was out of their control. For having the audacity to challenge themselves, they paid a giant price. If you ever blame schools for playing cupcake schedules in non-conference play and for not playing marquee opponents, well in 2000, Oregon found out the hard way why doing so can be a really bad idea. Because this is the story behind what has to be, without a doubt, the dumbest tiebreaker scenario in the history of the Pac-10 Conference, and the story of how the Oregon Ducks were completely out of luck. Before I talk about the tiebreaker in question, and just how bad and backwards it was, we need some context to understand how we even got to this point in the first place, mainly, a point where such a tiebreaker scenario was even necessary. The year is 2000, and it was an incredibly bizarre year in the Pac-10, because if there was ever a year where there were haves and have-nots, this was the one. You were either a great team that was one of the best in the nation, or you were a bad football team, and there was no in-between. Because when all was said and done, you had 7 of the 10 teams finish at or below 500, and 3 teams that clearly separated themselves from the rest of the pack. And one of those teams was this team that you've been watching this whole time, the Oregon Ducks. During the second half of the 90s, the Ducks were consistently good, but once the 2000s hit, it was as though they made the jump from a very good team to one of the best teams in the country. Because in 2000, even though Oregon had never won 10 games in a season since the program started play back in 1894, things were looking incredibly promising that this century-long drought of theirs would be broken. At one point during this 2000 campaign of theirs, the Ducks won 8 straight games, with 3 of those wins coming against ranked competition, including 2 wins against schools ranked inside the top 10, in a number 6 ranked UCLA team, and a number 6 ranked Washington team. They had a really good offense, led by arguably the best quarterback in the Pac-10, Joey Harrington, who led the conference in passing yards and in passing touchdowns, becoming just the 3rd quarterback in Oregon history to ever lead the conference in passing yards, and the 6th quarterback in school history to lead in passing touchdowns. Combine that with a rushing attack led by Maurice Morris, 
who was second in the conference in rushing yards, and it's not hard to see why their offense was so hard to stop. And if you don't believe me, just ask Arizona State, who lost to Oregon 56-55 after Harrington threw six touchdowns and no interceptions. After their eight-game conference schedule, the Ducks found themselves sitting pretty with a 7-1 record. However, despite their great season, they did not have sole possession of first place in the conference. Far from it, in fact. Because also tied with Oregon atop the conference with a 7-1 record was this team right here, the Oregon State Beavers. In Dennis Erickson's second season as head coach of the Beavers, he took a program that was usually a laughing stock, having not finished ranked since 1968 and having not won a bowl since 1962, and made them one of the best teams in all of college football. Their offense led the conference by averaging well over 33 points per game, thanks to a great passing attack led by quarterback Jonathan Smith, who led the conference in passer rating, and thanks to a great rushing attack led by running back Ken Simonton, who led the Pac-10 with 1,559 rushing yards and 19 rushing touchdowns, becoming the first Oregon State running back to lead the conference in rushing yards since Dave Schilling in 1970. The first Oregon State running back to ever finish this season in back-to-back -back years as the league leader in rushing touchdowns, and just the second Oregon State player ever to finish as the conference leader in the same season in rushing yards and rushing touchdowns. Combine that with a suffocating defense that allowed just over 17 points per game, ranking 11th in the entire country out of 116 teams, and you've got a team that was not just one of the best in the nation, but you've got a team that might have been the best Oregon State team ever assembled. And it's not just that Oregon State was great, because also tied with them atop the conference with a 7-1 conference record was this team right here, the Washington Huskies. Unlike Oregon and Oregon State, Washington actually entered the season with relatively high expectations, as they were ranked number 13 in the preseason poll. However, much like the Ducks and the Beavers, the Huskies were a really good team, and the moment they beat a number 4 ranked Miami team that eventually finished the season as the number 2 ranked team in the country was the moment that everyone knew they were for real. I think everyone knew that this year, in Rick Neuheisel's second year as head coach, that the Huskies were a legitimate contender. As a side note, to learn more about Neuheisel and his coaching tactics, click the card in the upper right corner. Washington was a remarkably consistent team throughout the entire season, and they ended the season on an incredibly hot note, scoring over 30 points in each of their final five games, thanks in part to the strong running of freshman running back Rich Alexis, who led the Pac-10 by averaging over 6.3 yards per carry. So here's the dilemma. You've got three teams tied atop the conference with a 7-1 record, with Oregon, Washington, and Oregon State fighting for first place and only one team can win the conference to get the spot in the Rose Bowl. As nice as it would be to reward all three teams with a Rose Bowl invitation, that's just not feasible. How do you break this tie? Well, the natural thing to do would be to look at head-to-head -head records and see if any of the teams pulled off a sweep. If you have three teams tied at the top, and one team beat the other two teams, then that team should get the bid. And to the Pac-10's credit, that was what they did. However, they weren't able to break the tie that way. On September 30th, Oregon defeated Washington by a final score of 23-16. The following week, on October 7th, Washington beat Oregon State by a final score of 33-30. And on November 18th, Oregon State defeated Oregon by a final score of 23-13. This means that all three teams went 1-1 one one against each other, so that doesn't work. That means you need something else to determine who's getting the Rose Bowl invitation. There are quite a few possibilities that make sense. You could look at the BCS ranking of each team, and just let the computer decide who goes through. In that case, Washington, ranked at number 4, would go on, since Oregon State was number 6 and Oregon was number 10. You could look at the point differential of each team in their head-to-head -head meetings against each other. In that case, Oregon would have a point differential of minus 3, Washington would have a point differential of minus 4, and Oregon State would have a point differential of plus 7. So the Beavers would go through. You could do what the NFL did back in the 1970s and rank each team based on the total number of points scored in Pac-10 play 
and their total number of points allowed in Pac-10 play, where the lowest score wins. As an example, if a team finished with the third best offense and the fourth best defense in the conference, they would get a score of 7, 3 plus 4. And you could finish with a best possible score of 2 if you were ranked at the top in both categories, or a worst possible score of 20 if you were ranked at the bottom in both categories. Basically, there were a ton of options that the Pac-10 had at their disposal to break this freeway tie. And they chose the worst and stupidest possible one. Because you want to know what the Pac-10 did to break the tie? They determined it by non-conference record. And right off the bat, you might be able to see a major problem with this. On September 9th, the Oregon Ducks traveled to Madison, Wisconsin to take on a number 5 ranked Wisconsin Badgers team. In a close contest, the Badgers prevailed by a final score of 27-23. Oregon's pass defense was superb, holding Brooks Bollinger to just 5 completions, a completion percentage of 38.5%, no touchdowns, 1 interception, and a passer rating of 65.1. Passer rating in college is calculated differently than passer rating in the NFL, but if you took his stats on that day and put them in the NFL, he would have a passer rating of 22.9 which is worse than if he did nothing but spike the ball into the ground on every single play. And Marshawn Tucker was unstoppable for Oregon on this day, recording 196 receiving yards and torching Wisconsin's secondary all day long. However, as you can tell from these highlights, it wasn't enough. Joey Harrington threw three interceptions, and Wisconsin had a dominant ground game thanks to the play of Michael Bennett, who finished the game with 28 carries for 290 yards, averaging over 10.4 yards per carry, and two touchdowns. And this game, as in the game against a number 5 ranked Wisconsin team on the road, was what kept Oregon out of the Rose Bowl spot. So let me get this straight. You can control who you want to play in non-conference play, and you can decide whether or not you want to play tough opponents or cupcake opponents. And if you play tough opponents that bring exposure to the conference, and get the conference on national TV. You're getting punished? What kind of a backward system is that? Oregon State went 3-0 in non-conference play, so they survived the first part of the tiebreaker. Their opponents were Eastern Washington, a Division I AA school, New Mexico, a 5-7 school out of the Mountain West, and San Diego State, a 3-8 school out of the Mountain West. They played an absolute joke of the non-conference schedule, and they're being rewarded for it, while going on the road to face off against the number 5 team in the country is being punished? The logic behind this makes no sense. You want to tell schools to play tough opponents and challenge themselves in non-conference play, and you criticize schools who play nothing but cupcake opponents. And then, you design a system that punishes schools who play strong teams? I'm not saying that Oregon deserved to win the tiebreaker over Washington and Oregon State, but at the very least, they didn't deserve to be eliminated off of this. Surely, there was a fairer way of dictating the champion than this absolute joke of a system. Oregon wound up going to the Holiday Bowl, while Washington won the tiebreaker and got the Rose Bowl invite, since Washington was also undefeated in non-conference play, and they beat Oregon State head-to-head. -head. Look, Tiebreakers to determine a conference champion are never fun, especially if they're messy like this one was. You want to settle it on the field. And no matter what system you come up with, and no matter what you decide, someone's going to be upset. But of all the solutions, this might have been the worst one that the Pac-10 could have come up with. Because it's counterintuitive, it punishes you for playing a tough non-conference schedule, and goes against everything that school should be doing. Because in 2000, when Oregon got eliminated from the Pac-10 title hunt due to a game against a non-Pac-10 school and the number 5 ranked team in the country at that, it left a ton of Ducks fans asking, what the duck? Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JaguarGator9. To see college football videos, subscribe to JaguarGator8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. 
Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping get the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.